from Newnan, Georgia. Live from Detroit, Michigan. Live from Portland, Maine. Live from Orange City, Iowa. Live from San Diego, California. And live at over 1,500 sites across the country, we're meeting today to take part in a new Citizens Opportunities Movement. And in this, the first American Opportunities Workshop. And now, to Sprayberry's Barbecue in Noonan, Georgia. Good morning, I'm Joan Scott. You know, all across America, men and women are creating and building better futures for their families, their friends, their neighbors. Together, Americans are once again bringing to bear human freedom to create an even greater chance for human happiness. You know, we decided in our Constitution that we the people have real power. Today, we see all over the world people pursuing that very same freedom. Now, during the next hour, you're going to have a chance to join with others across America in celebrating the success stories that are the essence of that American dream. With me this morning is our host, Congressman Newt Gingrich, and joining us live via satellite from Sea Island, Georgia, is former Attorney General Griffin Bell. Good morning, Newt. Good morning, Griffin. Good morning, John. Morning. And Griffin, I particularly want to thank you for being with us. I understand you've uh, recently had some surgery, and we're very glad you'd come with us live. We know it's been a little bit of a difficulty for you. Well, yeah, Newt, you uh, brought us all here together, and why don't you tell us why we're here? Well, I think we have to go back, frankly, to this document. This is a copy of the Declaration of Independence. You know, when our founding fathers got together and decided that freedom mattered, they pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor, because they thought human freedom was that important. And I want to welcome everyone, everyone here at Sprayberries, everyone at over 600 workshops around the country, and everyone watching us on Channel 20 in Washington, on the Family Channel, all throughout America, because we hope today that we're going to be able to establish the beginnings of a citizen's opportunity movement across the country, really building on successes you're going to see and other successes that we couldn't get into one hour that are occurring everywhere in America right now. All of us know that the bureaucratic welfare state has failed. We see it everywhere in East St. Louis, in Detroit, in downtown Washington, D.C. We see it in the Pentagon. We see that big bureaucracies just aren't getting the job done. And we know that the 25-year experiment in permissive attitudes has been a disaster, whether it's the disaster of the AIDS epidemic, the disaster of cocaine and crack and drug addiction, the disaster of violent crime, or the disaster of our young children not learning enough to read in all too many schools. So most Americans say, all right, the bureaucratic welfare state doesn't cut it, permissive attitudes haven't worked, but then for all too many of us, that becomes a reason to do nothing because they don't see the positive side. And the purpose of this workshop, the workshop gathered right here in Sprayberries, the workshops across America, and this program reaching out to every American, is to allow us to realize that there are success stories, that there's a key to an America that does work. And you know, we're meeting in an America that works. Sprayberries was founded in 1926. It's a family-owned business, just honest hard work put right into the traditional free enterprise system. Sprayberries was founded when there was a dirt road out front. They didn't even have electricity. They had to buy a generator to make their own electricity here. And today, not quite 70 years later, it is a remarkable nationally known institution that draws people from all over the country. And it's in that tradition of success, of can do, of getting the job done that we wanted to get together. Because we became convinced that America would be saved not in Washington, D.C., not by President George Bush or by any political figure. America would be saved by Americans by creating a citizen's movement that reached out across the country, and a citizen's movement that understood that there are principles that have worked for over 200 years, what we would call the triangle of American success, literally a little triangle that encompasses the essence of the American tradition. The baseline of that triangle is basic American values, honest hard work, saving, learning, planning for the future, the kind of things we all came to expect to be the essence of an American. Then second side of that triangle is entrepreneurial free enterprise, creating businesses, creating drive, the sense that I can go do something. And the third side is technological progress and free enterprise. We could combine those three into a triangle and we could suggest to people that inside that triangle there is an opportunity to apply common sense focused 
on opportunities and success. And if you apply common sense focus to opportunities and success within those principles, you're almost certainly going to do better than the bureaucratic welfare state and permissive attitudes. And that allows us to say to people, let's liberate folks, let's liberate county governments and city governments and local citizens and communities. Let's create an opportunity for people to go out on their own, not to try to solve the problem of education with one big decision in Washington, not to try to solve the problem of health care with one big conference at the White House, but to recognize that it will take thousands of experiments in education and thousands of experiments in health care. And that similarly, by decentralizing and giving back power to the American people, that all of us have an opportunity to create the kind of America we want to live in. So that's why we talk about a citizen's opportunities movement. And let me talk briefly about one example, one side of that triangle. Technological progress and innovation. You know, it's perfectly appropriate that we start with that particular concept, because technological progress and innovation is what lets us have this workshop gives us the cameras that are filming us, the satellite broadcast capability to be live across the country, the sheer computer technology to bring together six different sites simultaneously in what has been described as one of the largest private TV networks ever put together. This kind of technological breakthrough, whether it's the microwave oven or the contact lenses that I wear, is the kind of thing that has made America just different from most places on the planet. And we have a chance, I think, today to really talk about new approaches and new technologies. And Joan, that's why I'm so glad to be here with you. Thank you, Newt. We're going to go now to our site in Portland, Maine, where our hosts, Governors Lamar Alexander and Jock McKiernan, have a story showing how technological progress is helping to improve the environment. Gentlemen. Thank you, Joan. People. We're meeting here today to talk about new solutions to a whole range of, of problems, health care, uh, schools, the environment, and all are areas that require technological, crucial technological progress. Here in Maine, we're especially concerned about uh, preserving our important environmental heritage. Uh, in fact, uh, just down the road in Winslow, Maine, the man who's sitting next to me, Doug Sukforth, has initiated a new technology that I'm convinced is going to make a big difference for our environment. Doug Sukforth, Winslow, Maine. Technological progress. I feel it's, it's very necessary in the, that we get into high-tech uh, manufacturing and, and doing systems that, that will help the environment. Doug Sukforth's new technology is good for the environment because unlike current systems that use chlorofluorocarbons, it relies entirely on HCFC-22, a gas that's friendly to the ozone layer. The gas currently used in refrigerators is the main culprit in the destruction of, of the ozone layer. Uh, this requires a new refrigeration gas which requires a new refrigeration technology. And what you see here is that new refrigeration technology. Private industry, uh, their role is to, to see what needs to be done, develop the ways to do it, uh, come up with innovative ideas, new technology, uh, anything that will uh, help resolve environmental problems, reduce environmental damage. Doug Sukforth left his job as a mill worker and started out, literally in his basement, to build a high-tech company that now employs over 200 people. Doug is, a, is an incredible entrepreneur. His business sense is uncanny. He, he has shown the ability over the years at MidState to know when to change markets. There is no comparable technology to this that solves the problem in the unique way that they've, that they've got it solved here. And it's a question of, of the entrepreneur uh, looking out there at, at what the thrusts and demands of society are and then finding that niche in, in which the entrepreneur can become effective in bringing on the new technologies that are so important. I believe it's very important that, uh, and, and I feel good about being a part of something that's going to help this country uh, and help the world reduce uh, reduce their environmental problem. Thank you, gentlemen. We'll be coming back to you a little later on in the program. New technological progress really is an important part, uh, an important leg of that triangle. Um, didn't you write a book about this? I have to confess, John, we set this up a little bit. Mary Ann and I did write Window of Opportunity. It's a book that we're very proud of. And in fact, uh, in the entrepreneurial tradition, we have to urge all of you to go out to the bookstore at some point next week and order one of these. But 
one of the chapters in Window of Opportunity is about space and the opportunities in space and the tremendous commercial potential space has for the future. I think, Joan, that's an important topic for us to look at. And we're happy to have with us here today Vice President Dan Quayle, who's going to tell us about recent happenings in space. I'm delighted to speak to you today about America's future. I'm convinced that this country's continued success depends on the same national characteristics that have produced our past triumphs. Basic American values, entrepreneurial free enterprise, and technological innovation and advancement. Nowhere are these national characteristics more important than in opening and developing the last frontier, which is outer space. A few weeks ago, an American company launched the world's first commercially developed launch vehicle, the Pegasus. The vehicle now makes it possible to launch small, affordable communications satellites. This achievement will open a trillion dollar industry, supplying new information services from space. As a result, cellular telephones, TVs, and two-way computer services will eventually be available anywhere on the planet. In the 21st century, space development will provide even more valuable products and services. New medicines and medical understanding could cure dreaded diseases and extend life. America has always been at the frontier of man's knowledge and his travels. We are a nation of people who seek out new things and new experiences. Let us join together all of our energies as a nation on this next and greatest adventure in exploration, the conquest and development of space. Thank you, and God bless you. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Newt, uh, why don't we talk now about the second leg of the triangle, entrepreneurial free enterprise. Um, I was, uh, why don't we talk about that? John, you know, entrepreneurial free enterprise, the idea of creating jobs, founding business, expanding wealth, is partly big. It can be Apple Computer, it can be Ted Turner founding Cable News Network, or it can be uh, Pat Robertson with the Family Channel, but it can also be just that basic family enterprise. You know, we're here today with the Sprayberry family, and the Sprayberry since 1926 have been right here creating jobs, creating salaries, allowing people to work here in Noonan, Georgia, to be able to earn the income that, after all, has to create, be created if we're going to have taxes to have government. And so entrepreneurial free enterprise, the ability to get out there and do things and to create wealth is a very, very important part of what America is all about. Thank you, Newt. You know, out in San Diego, entrepreneurial free enterprise is helping to bring back the barrio. We're going to go there now to our host, Duncan Hunter, in San Diego, who's going to tell us all about it. In the 1970s, the bureaucrats built the freeway through here, and things were pretty bad for a while. But today, Barrio Logan is a Jack Kimball-style enterprise zone. And people like Luis Garcia and his sister Lupe and their father, Chewy, who built the very restaurant that we're standing in, have proven that the spirit of entrepreneurial free enterprise can work, even under the toughest conditions. Now, here's the story. Luis Garcia, San Diego, California. Entrepreneurial free enterprise. I have people that have pulled off of welfare and they are still presently working for me. And they enjoy being able to hold up their head and they enjoy being able to, now kids, when they go home, this is not a welfare check, no, this is a check that I worked for. Luis Garcia started out as a one man business painting flagpoles, doing work no one else would do. I can't do it all myself, so I ended up going from the one man company to I presently have employed 83 people with a, about 150 additional people in the subcontracting end of my company. Last year, he completed his largest project to date a $5 million drug interdiction center for the United States Customs Service. Free enterprise obviously gives you, the entrepreneur, the business person, the, the opportunity to increase your capital, increase your resources, but it also increases your options of doing something good in conjunction with others. Taking care of Luis Garcia, I found that there's other people 
that I can also assist help who help me. I think that Luis really represents um, uh, the, the ability of someone who comes from a working class background to uh, really take advantage of his abilities and the opportunities that exist to uh, really um, uh, not only improve his own lot, but to uh, share that uh, success with other people. Now Luis Garcia is taking the lessons he has learned to the federal government. In a letter to HUD dated April 6, 1990, Reduce taxes and reduce bureaucratic tangles are important, but they are not the whole story. Businesses will not make new investments in the area, even with tax incentives, unless the problems that cause the area's declining are solved. So the Enterprise Zone takes a comprehensive approach. The labor force that we can deliver, the dedication that we can deliver, it's all based on the free enterprise system. And if we let it get away from us, it's going to be our own fault. I intend to see that never happens. Thank you, Duncan. Luis. Well, what do you think, Newt? Is Luis Garcia going to be successful in keeping alive the free enterprise system? You know, Joan, I think that just by the act of doing it, he is in fact a living success and an example for other Americans that you can make free enterprise work. And I know one person who agrees with you. Secretary of Housing and Urban Development Jack Kemp has traveled all over these United States and seen dozens of examples of entrepreneurs who are really making a difference. He's with us now to tell us what he's learned. Greetings to the millions of people with us today for this American Opportunities Workshop. It's a real pleasure for me to be with you. And I want everybody to know how much confidence I have that the Luis Garcias of America are not only seeing to it that the free enterprise system survives, but more importantly, that that entrepreneurial spirit catches on and grows, not just throughout mainstream America, but those barrios and ghettos throughout our poor urban and rural areas of the nation that have been left out and left behind. There is a Luis Garcia in more places than the skeptics and naysayers ever dreamed of. I've met him. Jesse Tolles in Dallas, Alicia Rodriguez in East LA, Irene Johnson in Chicago, and men and women all over America are taking part in a great effort to declare independence from poverty. There's a new burst of energy in America today, and I believe with all my heart that President Bush wants to give full reign to that power, that possibility, and that potential. He's introduced the most far-ranging, anti-poverty, incentive-oriented strategy uh, since the war on poverty 25 years ago. It's called HOPE, H-O-P-E, Home Ownership and Opportunity for people everywhere in America. Opportunity for people to help people help themselves. President Bush has made it very clear that he wants to make America an opportunity society for all people. That they're ready. And from bed to Boyle Heights, and from Overtown in Miami to Motown, Detroit, people are saying, freedom works and we want to make it work for ourselves and particularly our children. That to me is the challenge of the decade and I look forward to working with you to make it happen. God bless you. Thank you Secretary Kemp. Well, from the barrios of San Diego to the ghettos of New York City, entrepreneurs really are making a difference. But Newt, I feel there's more to what you're saying than just free enterprise and new technology. Joan, you're exactly right. You know, what underlies the Doug Sukforths and the Luis Garcias and all the many people that Jack Kemp talked about is a basic American value system. Uh, honest hard work, the willingness to take responsibility, the belief that you can get things done, commitment to learning, to saving, to preparing for a better future. All those basic values that we read about as children that characterized the pilgrims, that characterized the folks who founded Jamestown in Virginia, it's what made the Founding Fathers different, is that they went out to change the world, not just complain about it. And one of the real keys, the base of the whole triangle, is this concept that we together can create a better future. The we together can do things by taking responsibility. I think that's part of what was missing for the last 25 years. Freedom isn't just a word about privileges. Freedom is a word about responsibilities. And citizenship has to involve a commitment to life, a commitment to learning, a commitment to honest hard work. 
And I think that, Joan, is why I'm, the whole concept of basic American values is the base of the triangle of American success. Thank you, Newt. We're going to go up to Detroit now, where Keith Butler has a story that really emphasizes one special American value. And that value is a parent's concern that their children receive the best possible education. Thank you, Joan. We have with us today Paul Weirich, who helped teach me how to apply basic American values through active citizenship. And we have State Representative Polly Williams with us, uh, who's doing something really spectacular in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. In fact, Polly started out like we did here in Detroit. Really didn't have a lot going for us except uh, just our love and concern for our children. But when the public school system in Milwaukee tried to tell Polly that she had to bus her children across town to an inferior school, Polly did something about it. State Representative Polly Williams, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Basic American values. We are a black middle class community here. Parents bought their homes because they wanted their children to attend their neighborhood high school. But because of the law, it's against the law for our kids to go to school in their neighborhood and they're gonna bring other children in. This is a bad law and this doesn't make sense. What made sense for Polly Williams was that her children should attend a neighborhood school. What makes sense for the taxpayers is that they can do it for half the cost of sending the same child to public school. Polly sacrificed to get her children into the urban day school, then ran for the state legislature to fight for other parents like her. We are willing to fight, we're willing to struggle, we're willing to do whatever we have to do to make sure our children get a fair shake. And this is what we did here. We passed this legislation. It will now allow low-income families to choose to go to a school of their choice outside of the public school system. And this is something poor people have never been able to do. Polly is the kind of person that everybody loves. She, is the, she gets a job done. She decides what it is that needs to happen, and she doesn't let anybody or anything stand in her way. She believes in what she's doing. I was just determined that they were not going to defeat me, and that if they were not going to join me, they had to get out the way because I was going to roll right over them. And those that didn't move, I rolled right over them and went right ahead. And we successfully got this bill through this entire process. And this is the first time I've ever been able to go through the process here because the process is stacked against people like me who don't go along with the system, who who would do what is best for the constituents as opposed to the bureaucracy. We've been covering this particular story uh, since its inception. In fact, we were involved in helping uh, Representative Williams develop the Parental Choice Initiative for basically for two reasons. One, we felt that it's uh, extreme importance, particularly to low-income parents, to have this additional option for their children given uh, the problems with the public school system, the high dropout rates, etc. Secondly, we felt that uh, the private schools could provide the same children who are at risk of dropping out of school with the opportunity to get a sound, proven quality education. Now in Wisconsin, we've probably got the best uh, educational choice bill of any state in the nation. And it's to Polly Williams' determination and leadership that made it possible. I can remember the day that she came into my office uh, uh, several months ago. She was beaming. She was excited. Uh, her daughter had just given birth to a newborn son. And she told me with that gleam in her eye that, that her grandson was going to have something better. And if people in the Milwaukee Public School District thought that they could place him in any school that they thought was necessary, instead of giving him a choice, they were dead wrong. We are now going to be allowing poor parents to be able to vote with their feet as they say, that they can go ahead and bargain, they have leverage, they have money, they have power. And that's what we need to empower our people so that we in turn can empower our children. Polly, what's the lesson here? What can other parents learn from your experience? Well, I think the most important thing is, as the uh, tape showed, is that the key issue in this uh, parental choice legislation were the parents. We've got to make certain that the people who are experiencing the problem the most are the ones who are in the forefront on this issue. It's very, very important that we uh, put the parents in front on this issue, that there are expertise and skills within the parent body, and we utilize that. We organize 
from the bottoms up. I have a person with me here today in Detroit as one of those parents who happened to be one of the editors of one of our community newspapers, the Milwaukee Community Journal. Mr. Michael Holt was very instrumental in helping us to get this legislation passed. And again, it's the parents. Parents have to lead on this issue. We take our, our cues from our parents. And once the parents let us know what we want, then it's people like myself who then help facilitate the needs of the parents. And it's very, very important now that we put parents up front on this issue. It must be the parents. Thank you, Polly. We'll be coming back to Detroit in a few minutes. But, you know, first, Newt, I, I think the question that Polly's story raises is how can ordinary people be successful as citizen activists in, in trying to create change in their community? I mean, I, I think we see the direction we have to go in, but now the question is how do we get there? Now, I think, Joan, you put your finger on probably the key to this entire show and the key to the whole idea we're trying to develop. And I think Polly Williams is the perfect example. Here's a welfare mother of four children who works her way up, not just to be a leader in the smallest sense, but to be a leader of, in a national sense, to truly change life with a thousand children this fall in Milwaukee who are gonna have a choice about where they go to school because of her leadership. And I think she ought to be a symbol for all of us. I used to teach history and back around 1840, Alexis de Tocqueville, a Frenchman, came to visit America. He wrote a book called Democracy in America. And in this book, he talked about what made America unique, what made it different. He said it wasn't the government, it wasn't the president. It was, in fact, that every citizen had a unique sense of what it meant to be an American, and that every citizen was willing to go out and to do things, to take on their own responsibilities. We're talking about active citizenship. What this whole program is about is the concept that you, whether you're at home watching on the Family Channel or whether you're at one of the workshops, wherever you are, that you have the potential as an American citizen to truly make a difference. We believe that if you'll be inventive, if you'll find the things you can do, if you'll find the ways you can go out and practice the process of citizenship, that you can truly have an impact on your neighborhood, on your family, and ultimately on your country. And we think the best way to learn, frankly, is by doing. You can read about politics and self-government. You can study it in classes. But when you get out there and you start practicing, and whether it's helping one individual citizen learn how to read, whether it's helping a homeless person with a better life by helping them get a job, whether it's developing for your own children and other children in your neighborhood a better future, step-by-step -step Americans can make a difference. Founding a recycling center to help the environment would be just one example. Furthermore, we think that the basic American value that comes up again and again in our history is try, try again. We're not always going to be successful in the very beginning of this effort, but we can be successful if we try over and over again. We also want to encourage you to be noisy. You now live in a country where you have cable access television, where you have radio talk shows, letters to the editor, all sorts of opportunities for you to make a difference and for the people right here at Sprayberries to make a difference. Lastly, we want to encourage you to create a team to recognize that in your community, in your neighborhood, among your coworkers, there are other people who want to be effective and active. And one of the reasons Joan and I wanted to share part of this morning with you is to encourage you to develop the kind of teamwork, the kind of opportunity to work together that might lead you to make new friendships, create new activities, and discover all sorts of new opportunities to apply common sense focused on opportunities and success. It's in that framework of active citizenship what Alexis de Tocqueville 150 years ago would have understood, that we think we can create a citizen's opportunity movement. Thank you, Newt. Well, one place where citizen involvement hasn't died is in Iowa, where Fred Grandy has a couple of stories showing citizens using common sense to get things done that the bureaucracy couldn't. Fred. Thank you. Joan and Newt, that thunderous applause that thunderous applause you're hearing is coming from the campus of Northwestern College here in Orange City, Iowa, where we are currently celebrating our 50th annual Tulip Festival. But this is a community and this is a state that has long believed in pragmatic solutions to problems, and I've got two I want to talk to you about right now. One involves a fellow over in Davenport, on the other side of the state, a fellow named Chuck Shantag, who has developed a system for Vietnam veterans to get back in touch with each other. And he has gone into partnership with the gentleman standing right here on my right, Tony Diamond, who has married that system with his own Veterans Affairs television network. Chuck Shontag, Davenport, Iowa. 
I was involved in the Tet Offensive of 1968 in Vietnam. We were the Da Nang Area REACT team. We were first people out the gate to engage the enemy, and I was the lucky one who ran into an NVA from about five foot away. Uh, we both started shooting immediately, and I set off one of his hand grenades. Uh, the next thing I knew, I was down and bleeding, and one person came to my rescue. It was Jim Carroll. Chuck Shontag and hundreds of thousands just like him returned to a country that didn't understand and a bureaucracy that didn't care. I had to know who this guy was. And that's why I started the Vietnam Veterans Locator Service in 1985. It had one function, was to find Jim Carroll. And it's something that I couldn't do through the government, through the Marine Corps, through the Social Security or the VA. They just would not give me this information. After being turned away by the government, Chuck invented Buddy Search, which he runs from a personal computer in the living room of his home. What value do you see in this Buddy Search? Is it doing any good? Is it doing any good? Well, I know in finding Jim Carroll, it solved a lot of unfinished business I have from Vietnam. Tony Diamond, president of Bravo, produces a weekly television program shown on community access stations across the country. Recently, he and Chuck joined together to force the bureaucracy to work for veterans, not against them. If a veteran has a problem, he comes to us, we send him to the proper place, put him through the bureaucracy, and if it doesn't work for him, we let that bureaucracy know. This is why we exist right here, to cut through the paperwork. But in the process, we've become such a, such a success that they now use us. You have to have heroes nowadays. We, we haven't had, I believe we haven't had those for a long time. And so you need guys that are going to take something out of their, their own hide to make it a better world. And I think that's the value of people grabbing something that they can believe in and go with that seems to help other people. And I think that's what Chuck's doing. Sure, I help a lot of vets and have helped a lot of vets over the years, but uh, I seldom tell people, this is good for Chuck, too. This is really good for Chuck, and that's why I do it. Thank you, Fred. Tony, I understand we've just gotten some footage uh, from your show on the Buddy Search System. Why don't you describe what we're seeing? Well, Joan, the last time these two soldiers were together, they were both wounded severely in the same combat action, medevaced, and hadn't seen each other for 20 years until that day at Firebase Phoenix. Another buddy search, another buddy found. Tony, I want you to know that that's an extraordinarily emotional thing, and all of us here want to thank you and Chuck for the tremendous work you've done and the kind of things I think all of us ought to give them a round of applause, not just here, but around the country. I also want to recognize Tom Birch, chairman of the National Vietnam Veterans Coalition, because he has also been deeply involved in this, and we appreciate that kind of work, and we're delighted to have this opportunity to share it with you. Let me go back, I think, now to, uh, to Fred in Iowa. Well, thank you, Newt, and thanks to Tom and Tony. I want to tell you another story that takes place right here in Orange City, and it's a story that's not unlike a lot of rural communities. The big problem is how to enhance the quality of life in rural America. For example, in this town, we have a labor shortage caused in part by a lack of adequate housing. But the citizens of this community have gotten together to form a coalition that merges common sense with common good, and we call it the Orange City 21 Foundation. Orange City 21 Foundation, Orange City, Iowa. I am thrilled that there are people in this town that have the foresight to plan for the future, so that if I want to, my children to have the opportunity to be raised in a small town like this, somebody's planning for economic opportunities for them and for housing for them and that they won't necessarily have to go elsewhere to, to be able to um, be employed. Orange City, Iowa is a model community, but even model communities have problems. Orange City's problem? Too many jobs, not enough houses. Even through the tough years, Orange City has survived real well. Uh, we have enough industry. Uh, in fact, we have more industry than we have people living here. So now we're trying to find homes and get more people in to, to work in all our industries we have. Right now, Orange City has a housing shortage. 
We uh, just recently ran a survey where they say we're 120 units short for a town our size and the people that we employ. The foundation will be the facilitator to make things uh, happen and to bring up needs and probably solutions to those needs. We really are looking to uh, trying to develop a model, a model small community in a rural state for quality of life issues. Orange City represents an America many people have forgotten, a community focused on hard work, determined to succeed on its own terms. Things work better when we all work together. We don't always have to wait for the government to step in and do things for us. We can do them ourselves. Generally, this community has uh, done it on their own, and uh, uh, it would be my opinion that uh, more of that should be done. The Orange City 21 Foundation was founded by a group of concerned citizens applying common sense to secure a prosperous future for their community. We're looking to other types of issues beyond strictly the economic in terms of trying to develop that vision. The best small Midwestern community that we can develop is our goal. Newt. Standing with me now, we have Dave Van Englen Hoven, Chuck Chabla, and Greg Petticourt, three of the founding fathers of the Orange City 21 Foundation. Fred, I want to thank all of you in Iowa because I think that is a perfect example of what we mean by a citizen's opportunity movement. You know, Nude, I think one of the things I'm learning here today is that these success stories are happening all over America. I think that's exactly right, Joan. Everywhere you look, you see an opportunity for new involvement and new concern. You know, probably no other city in the United States has seen harder times these past few years than Detroit, Michigan. We're going to go back there now, where Paul Weirich is going to tell us some of the exciting things that Keith Butler is doing to get this city moving again. Paul? Well, Joan, for the past decade and a half, the Free Congress Foundation in Washington has been providing citizen activist training all over the country. Literally tens of thousands of activists have been trained in how to participate in the political process. But none that we're more proud of than our good friend Keith Butler, who's sitting next to me here. Back in uh, 1964, we held a training conference in Chicago. And Keith and his friends from Detroit drove all night to get there at 7.30 in the morning so that they could learn the political process. And then a year later, we came to this very church and conducted a training conference for the people at this church. And while I certainly don't want to suggest that we deserve any of the credit, I can tell you one thing, and that is that Keith Butler here in Detroit has developed, in my opinion, the most successful citizen activist movement in this country. City Councilman Keith Butler, Detroit, Michigan. I've never have been one to follow the crowd. I do what I believe is right, regardless to which way the crowd is going. Keith Butler grew up in a Detroit that was decaying, where city government had been turned over to the bosses. He became involved in the church and in 1979 founded the Word of Faith Christian Ministry, a church that emphasizes a Christian's responsibility to be involved as a citizen activist. My whole ministry emphasizes how to uh, apply the scripture to daily life. That's what I do on Sunday morning. I teach for 59 minutes, and I teach people how to apply scripture to their, to their children, to their job, uh, to their home, uh, etc. And uh, the ministry's been very successful when we started from scratch a few years ago. Citizen activism to me is basically being a part of the day-to-day -day input of making a change. Paul, you do these training programs all over the country. What are you seeing as you travel around America? Well, we're seeing, Newt, uh, all kinds of people who never before have been involved in the political process, a literal explosion of people just like the people at this church that we came to train in 1984. I think, let me uh, turn to you now, Joan, I believe, and, and let's talk a little bit about what develops from here. Well, one phrase we keep hearing popping up again and again is, is common sense. You know, it, though it does seem, when you 
talk to normal folks everywhere, including right here in Sprayberry, is that common sense ought to be more common. But the bureaucratic welfare state, the regulations and the rules, all the things that stop us from applying common sense are a real problem. One person who I know has applied common sense throughout his lifetime, both as a federal judge, as attorney general, and now back in private practice, is Griffin Bell, our co-host down in uh, Sea Island. Griffin, I'm curious, what do you see as you've been watching this show? This is all, this is all very exciting. Uh, it's particularly good to hear some of the good things that are going on in our country. We, we often dwell too much on the bad things. Uh, my field has always been the uh, law and law enforcement and uh, we are, as a people, we are very frustrated by the operation of the criminal justice system. We, are, we seem not to know what to do with the uh, inordinate number of criminals that we have. Some are not punished, some get out of jail, out of prison too early. And uh, it's good to have with us today Sheriff Perry Grogan from Paulding County, who is using common sense in his law enforcement operation there in Paulding County. Incidentally, Paulding County is right next door to the county that Sprayberry's barbecue is in, uh, Mr. Grogan. Sheriff Perry Grogan, Paulding County, Georgia. I think a criminal that gets five years for a burglary, let's say, and he only serves six, eight, or 10 months of that sentence, uh, that doesn't teach him a lesson. Like hundreds of communities across the country, Polding County had a problem. Too many prisoners, not enough space. Criminals being released back onto the streets without serving their complete sentences. My reason for building a larger jail was to protect the taxpayers years down the road because uh, we use about 60 to 65 of the 200 beds we have now. So we finally came down to an agreement instead of a 100-bed jail, we'd build a 200-bed jail, and I would rent out 125 beds uh, to other counties or to the federal people. Perry Grogan had to fight the bureaucracy for Paulding County's new jail. The plan when he took over was to build a conventional jail that would barely fill the county's present needs. Grogan fought for a jail that made sense. A modular jail, which at a far smaller cost per bed, would meet the county's needs well into the next century. With the facility that we built, we saved the taxpayers of Paulding County four and a half million dollars. Up front, that is one of the most important aspects of it. We also increased the bed size from the previous proposal of a hundred bed to a two hundred bed facility. This built in uh, room for future expansion, and at the same time, this is probably the only only department in, in Paulding County government that is a money-making department. I've been a businessman all my life, and common sense always prevails over uh, uh, anything else. Uh, this is certainly a common sense prison. The criminals are in jail where they belong, and uh, uh, we've proven to the people that deal in drugs in Paulding County and the surrounding counties to stay out of Paulding County. The common sense is that the people elected me to do what was good for them, to spend their money wisely. For Perry Grogan, it just made sense that criminals convicted in Paulding County should serve their full terms. I think we as a, as a society and as, as a nation is going to have to say, well, we'll take politics out of all of this and we'll put, we'll put the criminal in jail and we'll keep them there. Judge Bell, that's really an impressive story. Um, don't you think that's happening more often now? Oh, yes. Yeah. This is a good example of how we have to depend on local law enforcement officers to, if we're to have any protection at all from the criminal. Uh, I think this is very exciting. Uh, and it's been, I'm sure, being replicated all over our country. Griffin, I don't know if you know Perry uh, Grogan uh, personally, but Sheriff Grogan's right here. I'm going to ask you to stand and give you a round of applause. That's really great. Huh? Paulding County and see you jail. Just first chance I get. 
Uh, I think you're going to. You may have a visitor from a very distinguished visitor in the near future, Perry. And I want to tell you, we all appreciate what you've been doing very much. And Griffin, I really appreciate the extra effort you went to just a few days after a surgery to participate live from Sea Island, and we're delighted to have you with us on this program today and helping create a citizens' opportunities movement. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Thanks. What a wonderful man. I'm really glad he was able to join us. A terrific effort on his part to be able to do that. I think so. You know, Newt, I think we have time for a few questions from our participants here today. Um, why don't we start in Iowa with uh, Fred Grandy. Fred, do you have a question for Newt? Well, Joan, as a matter of fact, uh, Darren Cloyce here I know has a question to ask Newt. Newt, you talked a lot about the federal bureaucracy. I'd like to know um, what the impact, would you feel the impact the federal government has had on the budget deficit? Well, I think it's very clear that uh, if we did things the way you do in Orange City, we wouldn't have a federal deficit. We'd have a federal surplus, and we'd be paying off the national debt. The kind of flexibility and innovation and good citizenship, the activism you're showing in the Orange City 21 program is the kind of message I want to take into the Budget Summit on behalf of Fred Grandy and others who have asked me to be their whip. So we appreciate those new ideas and those new approaches. Thank you, Newt. Uh, Fred, I think we have a question um, uh, for, for you up there from right here in Georgia, someone in our audience. Uh, the Carrollton High School principal, Pat Wright. Pat? Where are you, Pat? There you are. Uh, for Tony, Tony, we have a very exciting program that we're using at Carrollton High School called Express Exchange, which allows us to get uh, up-to-the-minute information from around the world and uh, some exciting educational program into our school. However, we don't have anything specifically concerning uh, veterans affairs. Do you think the program that you're doing uh, might be replicated in, in schools also? Absolutely, Pat. Bravo covers all sorts of veterans issues and topics uh, from Chuck Shantag's story to the everyday uh, following of what's going on at the Department of Veterans Affairs. And you know, today's young people just don't understand the Vietnam War or what happened to that Vietnam veteran when he came home. And they want to know, so I think it would be a wonderful idea to bring into the schools. You know, currently Bravo Veterans Forum is on more than 30 or 70 uh, cable access stations across the country. And I do want to get it on a lot more of them, and I know that I would love to work with you to find a way to bring it into your school, to you, to all of you, because America needs to know. Thank you, Tony. Uh, Keith Butler up in Detroit, does, does someone have a question there for Newt? Yes, Joan, we have Andrea Harris, a citizen activist here in Detroit, and she has a question for Newt. Hi, Newt. Uh, I'd like to ask, which of the, the components of the triangle could, be, could best be applied to the uh, public housing system here in the city of Detroit? How would I go about implementing those particular components of that triangle to, to change our system here in Detroit? Well, Andrea, you put your finger, frankly, on one of Jack Kemp's biggest crusades. He wants to really bring all three parts of that triangle right to bear. He wants to, by having tenant management, by continuing the kind of experience we've started around the country where we allow the people who live in public housing to have more control over their lives, to bring right into Detroit both basic American values and entrepreneurial free enterprise and technological progress. So I think that uh, we, we will have, with Jack Kemp at HUD, a real effort to work with you in Detroit to develop those new approaches for public housing. Thank you, Newt. Uh, Keith, before you run away, um, I'm hearing that we have a question for you from Duncan Hunter in San Diego. We're especially excited about how, how Polly and Keith have brought choice to the school system in Detroit. Daniel Hernandez here has a question. Councilman Butler, I'm interested in finding out what advice you would give to the average citizen who wants to get involved in bettering their community. Well, I think a person who wants to get involved needs to understand the political process, get involved in a political party, uh, get involved in citizens' organizations, uh, and decide to roll up the sleeve and, and go to work. Uh, uh, that's what Polly did, and she's done it very successfully, and we're very proud of what Polly has done. Thank you, Keith. Uh, right now, I think we have a question from uh, Lamar Alexander and Jack McKiernan up in Maine. Gentlemen? That's right, Joan. Uh, State Representative Mary Webster, who's our House Republican leader here in Maine, uh, is with us. And I think she has a question of Newt about uh, drugs and crime. Hi, Newt. Uh, Governor McKernan has made some real progress at fighting drugs in Maine. And yet there are people that say that tough sentences and the prisons they require don't really work. Do you think tough jail sentences make a difference in fighting crime? I think it's clear. 
Mary, if you look at American history, that when we're willing to be tough on criminals, we're a lot better for the innocent. I think what Jock McKernan is doing right, and I think all of us have to be involved in a citizen's movement against drugs and violent crime. Thank you, Newt. Well, I'm afraid we're out of time uh, for questions because right now we're really excited to be able to present to you the President of the United States. Thank you. Let me say, not just as President, but as an American citizen, how great it is to join you all. What you're doing this morning really matters because I so deeply believe that the toughest problems facing America can only really be addressed by individual citizens helping each other one-to-one -one in a thousand small and diverse efforts across our country. In less than one lifetime, this country's led the world to victory over fascism in World War II, landed men on the moon, and brought the democracies to the triumph of freedom. If we can do all that, and we have, then we can certainly wipe out drugs, clean up our cities, straighten out our schools, take back our streets, and preserve our environment. But we won't do it with the equivalent of Normandy invasions or Apollo projects. Today's challenges are different, and the age of the centralized state is over. We must address these problems not through bureaucracies, but at the community level, one person at a time. And that's what I mean when I talk about a thousand points of light, a constellation of many individual efforts at the grassroots. America knows what works. Freedom works. And your participation in the American Opportunities Workshop, your activism as a citizen who cares, will ensure freedom and opportunity for every American. Thank you, and God bless you all. Thank you, Mr. President. That certainly inspires us to go forward. Joan, you know, we're very fortunate to have with us today the man who's really responsible for all of these workshops, a man who claims he first aided in Sprayberries at five years of age back in 1932, the chairman of GOPAC, a man who's going to tell us what we can do to stay active and be involved, Howard Bo Calloway. Bo, it's wonderful to have you here. Thank you, Newt. Joan, this has been such an exciting program. Uh, I've, I've just enjoyed every minute of it. But you know, Newt, you'll recall, when we first talked about this program six or eight months ago, we said that if it's just an exciting program, if it's just another television show, no matter how good, we'll be a failure. The only way we will not be a failure if people throughout this country, the thousands watching, the, the thousands in workshops, are really determined to participate, to make a change, to go to work, to change their communities, to make this country the country that can be. And we are now setting up a, a new program, a Citizens Opportunity Network. And in that program, we'll have a half an hour, at least once a month, starting on July the 31st this year. And we will give an opportunity to continue what we've started today, an opportunity for citizens listening to send in their own success stories. And all you have to do to join that network is to call our 800 number. That's 1-800-872-2798. And if you call that number, we'll give you a package of, it'll include this National Review Supplement, America, Build, Rebuilding America, a Citizen's Guide, It'll tell you everything you need to do to join in with us in this movement that's taking place throughout the country. And if you'd like to see this show, which you've just seen, if you'd like to have a tape to have for your own to show to your friends, or to put on your own workshops from this show, we'll give you that tape for just $10. Joan, I want to thank you. I want to thank Newt. This has been great, but it's only a start. Thank you, Bo. Let's repeat that 800 number one more time. It's 800-872-2798. For those of you out there who are interested in learning more about the American Opportunities Workshop and what we're planning in the future, you should call that number right now. And if it's busy, well, keep trying. And in the next few days, if you found you've misplaced it or forgotten it, you can uh, call us at GOPAC in Washington, D.C. Well, Newt, any closing remarks? Let me uh, say, Joan, that first of all, it's been a tremendous hour for us, a very emotional hour as we participated all across America. I think you and I have seen some folks that are doing real things that are changing America. But, you know, I started my part by talking about this parchment document, the Declaration of Independence, which says that we're endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights. But in order to secure those rights, our founding fathers were prepared to pledge their lives, their liberties, their fortunes. And this was brought home to me in the Congress when I had an opportunity in the last year first to meet Lech Walesa, the leader of Solidarity in Poland, a man who had changed Eastern Europe and who came to us and who said, 
In the very first words of his speech to a joint session of Congress, the first person who was a private citizen to speak to Congress since the Marquis de Lafayette in 1824. And he said, at the very beginning, three words, we the people. Not from this document, but from the Constitution of the United States. And we were all stunned that he felt that America's gift to the world was that we the people wasn't just for Americans, it was for all of us. In addition, a few weeks later, we had Vaclav Havel, the president of Czechoslovakia. He came to see us and he said that he had been in prison in October of last year and in December they offered him the presidency. He said, you know, that's real change when you can go from being prisoner to president in a few months. And he quoted from this parchment document. He said, when America promised that we are endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights, she didn't just promise for Americans, she promised for Czechs, for Africans, for Brazilians, for all human beings, that it was a universal right. And then he went on to say that what made America so unique was that our intellectuals were willing to live their words into deeds. And he cited that clause about the concept of committing our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. And I think both here at Sprayberry and for people all across America, the point I want to make as we wrap up this hour, which may well, as Bo Calloway said, be launching a brand new Citizens Opportunities Network as part of a Citizens Opportunities Movement, I want to be able to say to folks everywhere that we don't have much right to complain unless we're active. We don't have much right to gripe unless we're involved. We don't much have much right to claim we're free unless we're responsible. And what the Citizens Opportunities Movement is all about is the opportunity for every American to be involved. Polly Williams, Keith Butler, Perry Grogan, Luis Garcia, Doug Sukforth, literally from shore to shore, from Maine down to San Diego. Every background, every nationality. The key to America wasn't asking who you've been, it's asking who you want to be. It wasn't asking what you've done, it's asking what you will do. And what we want to create is a true citizens opportunities movement, not a Republican movement, not a democratic movement, not a liberal movement, not a conservative movement, but we want to pick up this great, wonderful tradition. A tradition that in a very real sense is being taught to us again, where we have people all over the world saying back to us, centralized bureaucracies are dead. Well, if they're dead in Poland, shouldn't they be at least looked at in Pittsburgh? If they no longer make sense in Warsaw, shouldn't we question them in Washington? And in addition, let me just say, we saw today the proof that America can still work. The proof that individuals, men and women, of any age, of any background, if they'll get out there and try it, they can create a better future. So I hope everyone in the workshops, everyone in the Family Channel, everyone everywhere, as they look at this, will decide that a Citizens Opportunities Movement, the thousand points of light, made real by 250 million individual points of light called citizens, that those will create the kind of future that will let us give to our children and our grandchildren a drug-free, safe, educated, and productive America. Joan, it's been good being Aww. with you. Thank you, Newt. Thank you. Outside now, I'm going to work at the local workshop that we have right here in Sprayburg. So, why don't we all go on outside now?